Hi, and thank you for tuning in to Noir Histoire. I'm Natasha, and in this episode, I'll be discussing The Secret Lives of Baba Segi's Wives. The Secret Lives of Baba Segi's Wives by Lo Shanyan is a novel about a polygamous Nigerian man, Baba Segi, who has four wives and seven children. The household was stable and had a steady rhythm until the arrival of the fourth wife, Balanle. When she joins the household, her being younger and more educated than the other women incites their jealousy, which leads to them plotting and scheming to get her out. Her position is made even more precarious as her and the baby of says Baba Segi struggle to conceive a child, which leads to some big family revelations. Baba Segi is a man in his 40s, lamenting over the fact that after two years of marriage, his newest and youngest wife, Balanle, is still not pregnant. By the time they married, he already had three wives and seven children, yet he is insecure about his marriage to Balanle because unlike himself and his other wives, she's graduated from a university. When Baba Segi began showing an interest in Balanle, his friend warned that he was taking a chance with her. They planted fear in him that she's a beautiful young woman who's only interested in using him for his money and will eventually leave him for a younger man. He's been passively trying to impregnate Balanle, but with two years having passed and her still not being pregnant, he starts to worry. It's telling that his first instinct isn't to have a conversation with Balanle to express his concerns. Instead, he goes to teach her, a medicine man and advisor that the local men visit and hang around. I was kind of expecting teacher to give Baba Segi problematic advice, but was surprised that he was reasonable during their conversation. Teacher advised Baba Segi to try to communicate with Balanle in the manner in which he might be most receptive. The key there being that he felt the first step should be to have a conversation with Balanle. Given that she's attended school and values learned people, he advises that they go to a hospital instead of relying on medicine and potions. I think there's value in traditional medicine, but there's also value in modern medicine, so there's nothing wrong with using your discretion and mixing the two. Baba Segi owns a business which employs quite a few people and over the years has been able to create a comfortable life for him and his family. His financial status within the home and wider community has resulted in him being treated with a great deal of respect to the point of deference. He's the husband and father to all of the women and children within the household and thus provides for them. Baba Segi receives a grand welcome when he returns home from work at the end of the day. The children bow and prostrate themselves while his wives hustle about seeing to his needs. Respect is a big thing in the culture, so there's an expectation and thus a whole routine around his family showing their appreciation for him. The children are genuine, but a lot of the deference and fussing over Baba Segi on the part of his wives is really just a performance. There's a different vibe amongst the women when Baba Segi isn't around. The women have been married to Baba Segi for different lengths of time. This has resulted in a pecking order, and petty squabbles as they try to secure resources. In order of marriage, the wives are Segi, Tope, and Femi, with Balanle being the fourth wife. They each have their own individual relationship with him and play a particular role in the household. The children get along well and don't have any issues with each other, but sometimes they get pulled into the squabbling between the women. As the women attempt to ostracize Balanle, some order their children not to have any contact with her. When Baba Segi is around, the women aren't any warmer towards Balanle, but they try to hide their disdain. Unlike the women, Baba Segi is free to go and come as he pleases, so he spends a good amount of the day out of the house. This means that Balanle, who doesn't have children, is alone much of the time and doesn't really have anyone within the home um, that she can talk to or spend time with. It's a hostile environment, but she doesn't respond in kind to the other women. Women. This further annoys the other wives, as Balanle's naivete pushes her to be friendly and reach out to them, which leads them to suspect that it's just a clever plot. Baba Segi is rather insecure and has grown accustomed to the household revolving around him and everyone seeking his permission before making a move. The first three wives have learned how to stroke Baba Segi's ego, and some can manipulate to get her to do whatever they want. Balanle has had a different life experience than the others, and without fully understanding the flow and expectations of the household, she sometimes unknowingly commits breaches of protocol. When she has an idea or wants to do something, she just does it. Yet such is the household that her making seemingly insignificant decisions, such as leaving a room without asking permission, is a big deal. Without knowing it, Balanle has become a catalyst for discomfort within the household. The wives immediately regard her as a potential problem, and Baba Segi slowly begins to share their feelings. We get a glimpse into how Baba Segi and Balanle met and began seeing each other, but it's largely from Baba Segi's perspective. It seems they met and he was attracted to her while she thought he was nice. 
but it becomes clear that there were some details about her life prior to their marriage that has not been shared with Baba Sehi. That's not to say that she lied to him, but rather that they likely didn't spend enough time getting to know each other and discussing their expectations before getting married. It turns out that Balanle is not against becoming pregnant, and as teacher assumed, is open to visiting a doctor with Baba Sehi to figure out why they haven't conceived a child. The entire exchange at the hospital offers insight into Baba Sehi's psyche and personality. He just storms through the place like a bull in a china shop. It's not a matter of him not having much of an education, because you don't have to go to school to learn manners. The bigger problem has more to do with him living in a very closed world where achieving financial success has allowed him to stagnate as a person. There's a difference between book sense and common sense, but there's value in both. In Baba Sengi's case, he seems to have none of either, and it shows in the way that he moves through the world. A simple thing like going to the doctor with him is an entire ordeal. You get the sense that he's never been to a medical doctor before. Visiting a hospital is a new and uncomfortable experience for him, and to deal with his discomfort, he takes offense at everything. Refusing to ask for or accept directions, he instead stamps around the hospital going in the wrong direction until Balanle gently redirects him. Basic questions about what brings them to the hospital are met with his overly aggressive and hostile responses. When asked demographic questions, he speaks over Balanle to the point where the nurse becomes annoyed and asks why Balanle can't speak for herself. It becomes clear that when Babasegi doesn't know something or feels out of control, he responds by becoming aggressive or shutting down. He can't bear anyone giving him advice or telling him what to do. They meet with the doctor and begin discussing their experience thus far with trying to conceive. Their infertility as a couple, if they are infertile, can be a result of a medical issue with her, him, or both of them. Yet he automatically assumes that Bolanli might be barren. The doctor asks questions that seem typical for discussing reproductive health, yet he's offended. Part of this might be because the doctor is a man asking Balanle about her menstrual cycle and their sex life. These are intimate questions, but to be expected, and I would also assume that a physical exam would be required at some point. Granted, some terms used by the doctor might be unfamiliar and leads to Baba Segi becoming upset because he feels like they're talking around him and trying to make fun of him because of his comparable lack of education. The nurse did a double take upon learning that Balanle was a university grad because it doesn't seem to make sense that she'd be with Baba Segi. I felt sorry for him because it's obvious that he was uncomfortable, but his behavior was unacceptable. The doctor at one point threatened to call security because he was getting so out of control and disrupted the appointment. Appointment. Often, when we think of the pressure placed on people to get married and have children, it seems to be aimed at women. And thus, we think of women, their identities, and sense of self worth as being tied up in marriage and having children. Yet, in this case, a large part of Baba Segi's identity is tied to his wives and children. Having this fourth wife who is young and beautiful but has given birth to no children is a poor reflection on her, but also a poor reflection on him. He feels that the suspicions expressed by the other men might be true and he'll become a laughing stock. He's shot into silence upon learning that Balanle had sexual experiences before they met. And not just that, but her first experience was around 15, and she became pregnant around 16, though that pregnancy was terminated. Surprisingly, Baba said he didn't seem angry, but rather became very subdued. This was another instance where I found myself questioning how well these two really knew each other before getting married. They'd been married for two years at this point. The courtship seemed short, but was there an engagement? I don't think you have to tell your partner about everyone you've dated or sexual partners unless it might affect your relationship in the present, i.e. resulted in children, it's a relative slash friend of theirs, the person might pose a danger, etc. But wouldn't there be at least a basic overview of your past? You guys don't have conversations where you mention the basics of what went wrong or right in previous relationships and what you're looking for or need now? It's also revealed that Bolanle had been consensually sexually active, but her pregnancy was separate from that relationship and had been a result of rape. Experiencing a sexual assault or rape is something that a lot of people keep to themselves as an unfortunate result of feeling shame or a host of other emotions. I would like to think that you should feel supported enough in your relationship to tell your husband or wife about having such a traumatic experience, but I understand why
why some might choose to keep it to themselves. In this case, Belanle has kept this to herself and the experience has changed her tremendously as a person in the sense that there is a clear divide in her personality as far as who she was before and the person she is after. Her Ray played a role in her decision to marry Baba Segi. Without understanding the catalyst, Belanle's mother, Mama Belanle, was very upset that she married this older man with multiple wives. She worked hard to put Belanle and her sister through school and then university. Mama Belanle had high hopes that having obtained this education, she would put it to use and find a job that would enable her to live a good life. Mama Belanle regards polygamy as, as an antiquated way of living, but also seems to dislike Baba Segi as a person. Bolani married Baba Segi without her family's approval, but she still goes back to visit, though there is now some distance between her and her mother. By the time Bolani arrived in Baba Segi's household, the other three wives were already dividing the resources he provided amongst themselves according to their pecking order. A fourth wife now meant they would each get a smaller piece of the pie. None of them are described as being any more or less beautiful than any of the other wives, though Femi, the third wife, is regarded as a sharp dresser who Baba Seki enjoys taking out to show off. Yet Belanle is younger than the other wives, and there is fear that her newness will make her Baba Seki's favorite. Baba Seki has been married to Segi, his first wife, for about 16 years, so they have the longest history, and they likely are the closest in age. This would put Segi's age at around like late 30s to 40, while Belanle is now 25. The ages of the other two wives um, fall somewhere between. The oldest wife is seemingly the most mature, though that's not to be confused with kind, as she's with the foolishness too. It's just that she's more sure of herself, and it's reflected in her calculating demeanor. The second wife, Tope, is sympathetic towards Bolanle, so when things start getting hectic, she pulls back on trying to give Bolanle a hard time. Femi, the third wife, is really the one who brings drama to the story, and she's like low-key borderline insane, and becomes more of an instigator at the story progresses. In addition to Baba Segi, none of the three wives have gone to school or obtained much of an education. In an attempt to get into their good graces, Bolanle offers to teach them how to read and write. Segi and Femi flippantly brush her off as they only deal with her when they absolutely have to, and regard this as her putting on airs. Tobi, on the other hand, is actually hungry to learn. It's not a matter of having aspirations to a PhD or some other big dream. She'd just like to learn at least the basics so that she can understand her kids' schoolwork. But her lessons with Belanle are cut short by the other wives dissuading her against learning from the new wife. Tope is sympathetic towards Belanle as she doesn't feel as threatened by her. She seems like a genuinely nice person, or at least she's less petty and conniving in comparison to the other two original wives. But given the structure of the household and the pecking order, she's torn between the two factions because in being overly kind to Belanle, she might end up finding herself ostracized as well. Thus, when the other two wives begin to conspire against Belanle, Tope tries to stay neutral as much as possible. This lack of education in comparison to Belanle inspires a lot of insecurity. And because some of the wives are themselves doing wrong, they see offense where none is intended. They view her through their own prejudices and insecurity, which causes them to assume that she's looking down on them when she's really not. Bolanda is quite kind and makes efforts in good faith to be courteous, but the other wives have already made up their mind to not like her. With Baba Seki, Bolanle having been pregnant before, but now being unable to conceive is cause for concern. His underlying insecurities come to the forefront as he views there being two explanations for the situation. One possibility is that Bolanle medically can't have kids, and the other that she's specifically choosing not to have children with him. He sees it as a possibility that she seduced him knowing that she could not have children. This feeds his concern that she's just with him for his money. There's a building undercurrent in their relationship that when things first began, he was sweet, generous, and kind towards her. But he's preoccupied with proving his manhood by having children with each of his wives. With no children conceived, his feelings towards her began to change. I enjoy books like this, which have stories within stories. In this case, you get the background of Baba Seki's four wives, but also his story as well. Though the details differed, all four of the wives wound up married to Baba Segi due to problems within their family's home, though Balale's situation was further complicated by her rape.
Her father was an alcoholic who escaped from his responsibilities and difficulties in life by either physically leaving the home or through alcohol. To say Mama Bolanle was overbearing isn't enough, as she is described as being very difficult and constantly browbeating her kids. She has never-ending criticisms and is never satisfied and has nothing good to say. She encouraged her daughters to go to school and get an education so they could do something positive with their lives. Part of this was advocating for them to live modern rather than traditional lives so their experiences would be more full. Parents should encourage their kids and be hands-on and actively involved to keep them on track. But some parents, such as Mama Bolanle, go overboard to the point that their demands and unrealistic expectations stress the kids out and has the opposite effect of their intent. Bolanli looks back over her life and remembers coming home from school with great but maybe not perfect report cards. She'd fear having to face her mother as anything less than perfect would result in a complaint or punishment. To further give Bolanli a complex, Mama Bolanli would browbeat her about her grades and complain she's not trying hard enough only to turn around and tell her sister to be more like Bolanle. Mama and Bolanle's method of motivation was counterproductive, and what was likely meant to encourage Bolanle instead destroyed her confidence and self-esteem. After the rape, she felt like she couldn't go to her mother and tell her what happened out of fear that it would be viewed as another disappointment. Thus, it became a secret that she would carry with her. Over time, the various traumas she's experienced eat away at her. This is because instead of viewing herself rightfully as a victim, she instead regards it as a failing on her part and feels as though she's been defiled in some way. As a young woman, Segi was quite ambitious and had various hustles that allowed her to earn and save quite a bit of money. She might not have attended school, but was smart and used her mind to figure out how to provide for herself. Seki worked hard and rightfully took pride in what she achieved and prized her independence, but her mother was concerned that Seki being a female and openly displaying her wealth might make men in the neighborhood uncomfortable because they weren't as financially secure. She feared that it might spark jealousy and insecurity, which could lead them to violence. Seeing that her money gave Seki pride and independence, Mama Seki's solution was to arrange a marriage between between Segi and Baba Segi. When Segi and Baba Segi first met, Segi still had burning ambitions to be independent. She had a great mind for business, and upon entering Baba Segi's household, she used her business savvy to help establish and grow his business. It's unclear if she still plays a role in Baba Segi's business, but she is the one that actually runs their household. She distributes resources to the wives and is the one to figure out how to provide what anyone in the household might need or want. For all intents, Segi is the power behind the throne, running things from the shadows. She realizes that Baba Segi is insecure and needs to feel like he's in control. Having been together for so long and knowing Baba Segi the best, she can often manipulate him into doing whatever it is that she wants. Tope's father worked on one of Babaseki's farms, and he arranged the marriage as a result of a crop failure, which put him in arrears with Babaseki. She too dreams of independence, but her ideal situation doesn't involve money or other assets. Instead, she would like the freedom to live a simple life where she can once again experience the freedom she felt at having her hands in the soil. Unlike the other wives or even Babaseki, Femi comes from a financially comfortable family and lived a rather privileged life until her parents passed away. She was still very young when her parents died and family members grabbed up their assets before casting her into a life of poverty. She spent years working as a servant to people who treated her horribly. Being downtrodden took the fight out of her, and it felt like she'd never find a way out until she was introduced to Christianity by chance. Femi is a prime example of hurt people hurting people. She'd been kicked around as a child and young woman, and those wounds have scarred her as a person. When the opportunity arose, she got revenge on the people that wronged her and now sees herself as being chosen. Femi is devoutly religious to the point of being a fanatic and puts a great deal of faith in prophets at her church, which sounds like high-ranking members. Having come through her hardships, she sees herself as being good and anyone she perceives as being a threat or against her as evil. Baba Segi isn't a bad husband on purpose, I guess, but rather because he's clueless. He doesn't treat his wives terribly, but because of his own ignorance, he doesn't really understand how to make them happy and content. Part of the issue is that his wives tend to lie to him instead of having honest conversations about his shortcomings. They also came together because of money. 
As he and Balan Le go through the process of fertility testing, Babasegi's limited understanding becomes clearer. Balan Le goes through the required test and they now need him to undergo testing as well. It turns out that Babasegi has been sexually active with his wives and understands the basics of how to conceive a child, but for the most part, his sexual experience has been less motivated by pleasure and more by his overwhelming desire to have as many children as possible. He's not concerned with being a good lover to his wives or even enjoying himself. Conceiving children is the mission, and he's focused on getting the job done. Baba Segi has to visit the doctor's office to provide a sample and is completely lost when placed in a room by himself. Being embarrassed or uncomfortable in such an environment would be understandable, but in this case he doesn't know what to do to produce a sample on his own without assistance, and he becomes frustrated as occurs throughout the book when he doesn't know or understand something. This is a grown man in his 40s who isn't sexually inexperienced, but there's just so much that he doesn't know about the world or himself. He's able to complete the mission despite being out of touch with his own body, but he then feels a sense of shame as he worries about what his family, friends, or employees might think if they found out. I sympathize with him because it showed that while his wives were going through their issues, he is as well, and none of them were talking to each other about their internal hardships or insecurities. Baba said he doesn't strike me as a bad guy, but he's trying to fit the expectations of what his society tells him a man should be, even if he doesn't quite understand why or this isn't really who he is or wants to be. Throughout the secret lives of Babaseki's wives, we see that because of the culture, children are very highly prized. Regardless of whatever other success you might have, life is viewed as being incomplete without children. Not even necessarily being happily married, but specifically having children. For women being a mother and for men being a father, not having children reflects negatively on that individual's manhood or womanhood. Being unable to conceive or not having children is seen as a personal flaw and internalizes a failure. This might be decreases in America, but is arguably still a widely held view. Something that was pretty interesting here and also exists in the real world is that often any issues with fertility are assumed to be on the part of the female. Men and women contribute to conceiving a child, but an outsized portion of responsibility for reproduction and raising children falls to women. Sure, Babasegi already has children, so one would assume that he's fertile. But biologically speaking, he's now a middle-aged man, and it's been a while since one of his wives has been pregnant. It's natural for people's bodies to change over time, yet he is caught off guard at the idea that he would also need to be a part of the assessment of their fertility as a couple. Segi's and Femi's plotting began as petty behavior, but escalated to uncomfortable pranks and finally dangerous measures. In my mom's culture, there's a saying that when you dig a hole for someone else, make sure you dig two. One for the person you're plotting against, but also a second so there's one for you as well. Meaning that when you plot and scheme against other people, you should also prepare yourself as well for bad things to happen to you. The book begins innocently enough, but became a page turner as the story unfolded through twists and revelations. I was drawn into the story from the beginning, but became even more vested after getting a bit of background on each character. It made everyone feel fleshed out. With all of the plotting and scheming, it reminded me of a milder Game of Thrones where allies and enemies change and no one feels safe as they compete for resources. I find that with poorly written books, the characters tend to be saints or devils, but fortunately that's not the case here. The characters are very complex with both good and bad points. They do bad things, but it's typically for reasons that are understandable. Learning everyone's backstory puts their motivations in context. You still sympathize and understand. Because in understanding their backstory, it doesn't excuse their actions, but helps to explain their motivations. They might not be good, but over the course of the book, you come to care about about what happens to them. I began to want them to get the things they wanted for themselves, but didn't necessarily agree with the means that they were attempting to use. I've just touched on like the surface level of things, but there's quite a few twists and turns that will draw you in and keep the story chugging along. Although this is a work of fiction, both the characters and story felt realistic, like this is something that could truly happen. Polygamy is a major theme within the book, and it's used to shed light on these women strategizing against each other to obtain resources for themselves and their children, and actually strategizing against Babasegi. 
But you can also look at the story and apply it to life in general with people trying to get and obtain things for themselves. The pressures of society to progress along a predetermined path and have certain things in your life. That doesn't have to just be material possessions, but even experiences and relationships to be valued and respected within society. Pressure to do, be, and otherwise live up to these expectations can sometimes lead to people doing unsavory things in desperation. And they can go through all of that and end up unhappy at the end because they're clinging to or have chased after things that are at odds with what they truly need and value. There are quite a few themes and topics explored here, one of which is tradition versus change, and more modern ways of doing things. There's a contrasting of polygamous versus monogamous marriages, though neither is shown as being perfect. My preferences don't have to suit anyone else or vice versa, so I don't have an issue with either kind of marriage, so I'm not interested in being in a polygamous marriage. It seems like what's more important is paying attention to why people in a relationship are getting married and how they see things playing out. Failure to discuss these important topics and keep in secrets seems to be the key to unhappiness. The Secret Lives of Babaseki's Wives is an incredible book, and I started stressing a bit as I got closer to the end. I consider that the mark of a really great book, when you're reading and you just don't want the book to end. The story is so engrossing that you want to spend more time with the characters. That's not to say that I felt like anything was left unfinished or unresolved within the story, but rather that it was just so enjoyable. It was just the perfect length with nothing here that felt like fluff. Thanks for tuning in. Show notes are available on the Noir Histoire website by the link in the episode description. If you enjoy this episode and want more book recommendations, subscribe to the channel, click the notification bell, and check out my book review playlist.